Good afternoon, everybody. Uh, my name is Jamie Chambers. Uh, I'm a lecturer in film and TV at Edinburgh College of Art. Uh, I'm a filmmaker myself, and I'm the editor chief of the uh, editor in chief of the Film Education Journal, which is um, organising this conference. Uh, it is my huge pleasure and huge honour to be uh, talking today to one of my absolute favourite filmmakers, uh, Mike Figgis. Thank you for joining us, Mike. My pleasure. Um, and I'm um, happy to be here. Thank you, thank you. And so, Mike is 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 one of a kind of real star star studded list of filmmakers that we have with us this year. I don't know if anyone was was with us for uh, our session with John Sales last night, and and later on today we're going to be talking to the wonderful Italian filmmaker Michelangelo Fra Martino. But I guess I, I feel very strongly as someone that's been involved in film education for the past 10 years or so that it's very important to keep this strong connection with filmmakers, but in particular filmmakers like Mike, who are really kind of pushing the bounds of filmmaking and asking questions of not only of the industry, but of what a film is. And so, yeah, we're kind of we're thrilled to have Mike with us today to talk about lots different things I hope. Um, a couple of bits of housekeeping folks before we get started. Um, uh, my colleagues uh, are, are providing closed captions for this event so uh, and I believe my colleague Pascal is going to just paste into the chat if anyone uh, wants to access those captions they are available. For you. Um, I've prepared quite a lot of questions uh, for Mike today myself but um, equally it would be great to hear from you guys in the audience if there's anything that you'd like to ask Mike. We've got 90 minutes uh, which I'm sure will go very quickly. Um, if you guys have any conversation, if you have any questions, please just put them into the chat as and when they come to you. And I'll try and make space in the kind of latter third of our session today with Mike um, to ask those questions. And equally, if anyone would, towards the end of the session, if anyone would like to um, ask Mike a question directly themselves and switch on their microphone and, and switch on their camera. Um, if you would just like to make yourself known to to my colleagues, uh, I'm sure we can manage that. So just as just as a kind of brief introduction to our chat today, I wanted to kind of, uh, and this is something I haven't told Mike before, but uh, when I was a student, film student myself at the London Film School, this is maybe about 10 years ago, there was, there was one evening and one of my friends said to me, you've got to come and see this guy, this guy's coming to talk to us tonight, you've got to come and see Mike Figgis talk. Uh, now, at this point, I'd seen Mike's brilliant Oscar winning film Leaving Las Vegas, as I'm sure many of you guys have as well. And I, I thought it was great. But at that point, it wasn't entirely clear to me what made Mike different from some of the other filmmakers that we had coming in to talk to us. And but I went along, however, and and I slowly started to realize as I listened to Mike talk that that actually without knowing it, Mike was someone that I really really needed to hear from as as a young filmmaker and i think a, a key reason for that is unlike some of the filmmakers that i've crossed paths with mike has this wonderful commitment to trying to open things up really in what i consider to be quite a profound way and i mean that not just in terms of sharing the knowledge that he the considerable knowledge that he has built up over the years but also kind of actively challenging the sort of inertia that build up not only in the industry but in terms of the way in which we think about film as a genre and so after that kind of first fantastic session of hearing talk i went out and i bought mike's book digital filmmaking which we'll be talking a little bit about today and and similarly as a young filmmaker just found it absolutely exhilarating i think that there's something about Mike's approach and the way he talks about filmmaking and digital filmmaking, which is is punk in the absolute best sense of the word. I think, you know, Mike is a, is an autodidact. He's someone that kind of is hungry for knowledge and breaks things apart to learn things for himself. And, and as a result, is a great teacher. Like John says yesterday, he has the sort of intelligence that likes to break things apart. And as a result, is very good at opening things up and explaining things. So, and all of that made me very keen to try and get Mike along to speak at our conference. I mean, I think that, you know, as I say, Mike made a big impact on me as a filmmaker and I think is precisely the sort of person that we should be listening to as we think, particularly in Scotland, we, we ask questions about what is film education? 
what should it be what could it be and kind of mike's incisive intelligence his simultaneous reverence for cinema and his glorious irreverence for some of the dogma and the myth and the orthodoxies that build up around film and in the industry i think is precisely the sort of inspiration that we need to be drawing upon so yeah, we're going to talk a little bit about Mike's uh, amazing book, which I'd really recommend everyone goes out and reads, uh, Digital Filmmaking. Also, hopefully, talk a little bit about Mike's more recent book, The 36 Dramatic Situations, which is also a great provocation for filmmakers. And also, hopefully, bring in kind of a wider discussion of Mike's considerable experience as a filmmaker. So, Mike, maybe we could start. Could, could you tell us a little bit about where did your impetus for digital filmmaking begin exactly what 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 kind of prompted you to want to share your your knowledge in 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 such a form well i mean i you know i think it's important to say i did not begin as a filmmaker so um i got to filmmaking quite late you know like i was well into my 30s before i made a film and before that i studied music because that was my passion and actually I would sort of say the first thing you learn is becomes in a way your intellectual model for how you learn other things. So music is a very good, good way to actually uh, give the brain a structure because you know you can't understand music unless you understand the structure of music you know, if you want to compose. So I started off as a you know as an improvising non-music reading jazz musician because my dad was you know an obsessive jazz nut. Um, I think I wanted to impress him, but I also loved jazz. So I started playing the trumpet, the guitar. I started absorbing instruments and playing in a band when I was 16, a band that then became Roxy Music, actually, um, in Newcastle. And then I came to London, joined the Free Jazz Collective, which I still play with and all of that. So I was kind of like, and I jumped straight into free improvisation. I was like, okay, that was a, that was a bit of a mind blowing thing because but when I went to music school, I, I couldn't read music. I, I faked my way into music school because you couldn't get in unless you could. But I was enough of a, let's say, performing improviser. So I, I blagged my way in, then got into terrible trouble because I couldn't actually read music. And they do find out eventually, you know. But then I started to teach myself to read music, like laboriously. <clears throat> and it's hard by the time you're 18, if you haven't started doing it earlier, it's, a, it's, it's difficult. Um, and that kind of established two things. One is an idea of structure, um, you know, melody, harmony, bass, all these kind of things, and how uh, Bach being the best example of whatever, you know. And then this suddenly getting into the free music thing also kind of going, you can also destroy that, but you can only destroy it if you understand what it is you're destroying. So the idea of knowledge and then and then destructing that knowledge or rearranging that knowledge was established by the time I think I was 21, very firmly because I was absolutely loving what I was doing. I loved playing free music, crazy free music, you know, with a bunch of other crazy musicians, most of whom had also come out of legitimate music and had, you know, and we used to differentiate between people who would listen to that and kind of go, well, anybody could do that, sounds like a crazy child. And then realizing after five minutes, no, actually, it's actually a very complicated structure because it's anti structure. Unless you understand structure, you're not going to get it. So that was very interesting, realizing that of that anarchy in the aesthetic sense requires a real understanding of structure. You know, otherwise, you're just like, you just don't matter, right? So then in performance art work, I started to do form my own company. Like, so for 15 years, I, I worked as a performance artist, creating these, these structures, mainly obsessed still with music and sound, but starting to really understand, uh, you know, uh, theater, if you like drama structure. And then through kind of natural curiosity, started to use Super 8. Like, why not, you know, extend this slide, 35 millimeter, Video was crap at that point, right? I mean, really, it was VHS, which was kind of a, it was not not pretty, you know. Even if you want to be retro, it's not that great. Um, <clears throat> but I would literally explore as stuff came out. I'd I'd go and buy the camera, you know, so Super 8, got my own little Super 8 editor, laborious but 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 kind of interesting. And then 
a brief foray at the end of my performance art period of like wanting wanting something to go and study film, trying to get into national film school, not getting in, um, and being kind of angry at that in a way because I, I, I think I was the you know perfect person to go there. I'd had fifteen years of on the road experience. I knew everything about acting and all of this. I just wanted to learn camera and directing in a way. I, but, so I kind of you know fueled a little bit by being pissed off. I kind of went ahead and made a film uh, as part of a performance piece on 16, not Super 16, Standard 16. Um, and that was my first foray into, you know, kind of grown up film and editing. So I edited the film myself, just thrown into an editing room with a steam back. And again, like, wow, it was like Christmas day for me. You know, it's like, I mean, cutting, cutting on a steam deck is such a joy, you know, very, I mean, relatively simple, but physical, physical. And I kind of fell in love with the kind of physicality of, of that analog world. Um, started shooting on Super 16, bought a Super 16 camera, shot a really interesting film in Holland um, through my experimental theater connections, went to New York, by myself with a 16 millimeter camera and just shot a lot of stuff, put it into performance art piece. So I was kind of like, I was, I was hooked on the old camera stuff, you know? And then, uh, you know, a lot of luck, but being luck being in the right place at the right time and just boring people to death until they give you what you want. And then Channel 4, the lifeboat came along for me and many other directors, did my first one hour film in the house. And on the, back of that laboriously developed pitch storyboarded and did my first feature film Stormy Monday and then pretty much got pissed on here by the critics which of course is the British way um, but the Americans liked it and New York Times gave it a great review LA Times Madonna liked it uh, Sean Penn liked it. you know like it was like a little cult movie there and so on the strength of that not straight away, but I ended up with Internal Affairs, which was an, an amazing launch pad, you know, because it was a very successful, it's a good movie, great script, not by me, by Henry Dean. And so basically got me into the Hollywood club, for better or worse, for the next 15 years. But during that time, I was starting to make some money. And so, you know, as video stuff started to come out, the first serious camera, I think, was a Sony something in 1000. It was pre DV cam, it's like high eight or something. I think it was called looked at it the other day, the quality is actually was superb. I mean, it was very filmic, very saturated. Actually, in my opinion, aesthetically better than the next generation of cameras, but it, let's say it was the first 45 minute cassette. First, I think camera you could take seriously for video, very small, compact, good lenses and things like that. And so like I jumped in there and that, you know, from then on in, whatever came out, I was watching quite carefully. I was never interested in, you know, like the Ari Flex, I got to do like a broadcast quality one, you know, it's like, yeah, this big and, and how much is that going to cost? And, and when's it going to be obsolete, you know, uh, like next week, probably. Um, so I, I just went for the small stuff because also I had this, philosophy that you know everything should go into one flight case you know yeah, the microphones already looking at small audio recorders you know the again sony the, the mini disc recorders or oh, dat of course was very small very compact so all this stuff suddenly was getting micro you know um and i thought wow because what was clear to me by then was the hollywood system was about bulk you know I always quote this thing, you know, I interviewed, um, uh, you know, Mr. Top Gun, the producer, um, which is, you know, um, what's his name? Come on. Uh, Jerry Bruckheimer? Is it? Bruckheimer. Mr. Bruckheimer, yeah. And he was very interesting. So I did this whole series for Channel 4 called Hollywood Conversations. Everybody else was super cool. They came to my little office, single source of light from the window, one camera, right? Just a close up of them. And I asked Bruckheimer through his office and he said, sure, you know, uh, when's your crew arriving and who's doing hair and makeup? And I was like, oh, no, it's just me, you know, and I had my figure in my camera and he was like, that's it? And I'm like, yeah. So he got rid of his hairdresser and we did the interview, which was very funny. 
during which he said, you know, he kept reminding me, because so I'd be talking about stuff about creativity. He goes, Mike, it's called the film business. It's called show business. And there's a reason for that because it's not your money, it's somebody else's money and it's a business, you know? So you'd have to be kind of stupid not to agree with him in a way, you know? So like ideas about auteur and low budget and dogma, you know, are not realistic in that world, you know? So, you know, get real, you can have that world, but if you want to do the other thing, actually get the small, you know, suitcase full of small stuff and go off and do it with your mates or you know actors who want to do something for have three days off and can I can help you you know so so it was a kind of organic process where because you know I, this is not the time to go into Hollywood but it kind of I was pretty depressed after 12 years of being beaten up actually there and not fitting into that system and in a way dreaming of freedom you know so uh, and my my initial escape channel was Super 16. So, you know, I shot, I still had my cameras. So, you know, leaving Las Vegas, Miss Julie and lots of sexual instance were all shot on Super 16 on my own, you know, on my own camera that I owned as well as, and I, you know, so I'd have a DP, I would have, the, I'd be the second camera. We'd shoot two cameras, you know, and I loved, it was still, you know, compared to now, it's still quite a big camera, um, but it was film and it's something beautiful about it. And in those days you were doing analog transfer, you know, you know, film to film transfers. And there's something quite beautiful about that, you know, so there was no, up until I think maybe Lost Section was, maybe was the first one that was a digital um, transfer, you know, after the edit. Uh, I think Leaving Las Vegas was still, I'm not sure, but I think it was still old school system, you know. So, um, meanwhile, there's this whole revolution, industrial revolution going on in terms of the manufacturing of equipment, you know, and, and a kind of parallel universe where big business in Hollywood is literally shitting themselves because they see a huge threat from the small cameras. You know, dogma comes out and they've all shot it on a PD-150, you know. You know, and that's like, that's a terrifying, realistically terrifying concept to people who have a job in Hollywood, who have um, a second house, have three cars, mistress, wife, whatever, you know, swimming pool, very high standard of living, which they've been able to maintain. Suddenly, you see that as literally a, 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 a threat to your lifestyle, your job and everything. So the resistance, which was never openly spoken about, it's quite interesting, it was like, but there is a kind of unconscious conspiracy then to make, to accept the fact reluctantly that digital was here to stay, but let's make it as big and expensive as 35 millimeter was and as heavy so that four fat men need to carry the equipment again and you still have your trucks and actually they can be as heavy as they were before. We don't have to, we really don't have to scale down this, you know, we don't have to get silly with the Mike Figures routine, you know. So they, they, they've beautifully done it. I mean, God bless Ari Flex and everybody, you know, Sony, they've, they've made really big, heavy cameras again. I cannot tell the difference between something shot on a Canon or a Nikon Z6, unless you're in the biggest, I mean, and by the way, cinemas are closing like there's no tomorrow, right? So what are we watching on these days? A screen like this, your home cinema, and maybe a kind of everyman type cinema where the screens aren't huge, where the idea of 8K is actually ridiculous, totally ridiculous. And who cares? You've got a good film, you've got a good film. I mean, I always sort of say, make sure the sound's good um, and, and don't really don't care about the, the four, six or the eight K because that is actually just, that's a red herring, you know? And also, by the way, it looks awful. I mean, eight K, what actor wants to feature every blackhead on their body and then have to wear so much makeup to cover it because it's on camera that the makeup artist wants to commit suicide because all you're gonna see is the makeup because the quality is so good. So people, you know, actors have like, please go back to 35 mil and slightly out of focus, impressionistic, 
it worked fine, you know, it really did, it, it was, there was no problem. So that's, that was my route of natural inquisition and practicality into like, you know, exploring that tech, the low end tech, um, and really keeping an eye on it to the point where I thought, okay, aesthetically, I think it's good enough now. And now I think it's, um, we're now at the point where anybody can make a really good looking film, literally anybody in the world pretty much can get access. I mean, let's face it, where is it? The iPhone is, you know, this is amazing. I mean, this is an amazing camera. You know, you've got to put it on a rig just to not make it bouncy, but I've used it as a second camera when I've been stuck and it's like, it's fine. It's really fine. Thank you, Mike. And I mean, that leads us on to me to quite a crucial question, um, which is that, and this is something that you kind of touch upon yourself in the book, but um, one of the conversations I've sometimes had with some of my co-editors on the journal is this notion that, you know, through the, the digital revolution, cameras are getting cheaper and cheaper. And as you say, one has a, you know, probably pretty decent camera on their phone these days. Yeah. But um, one of my colleagues, Mark Reed, um, at the BFI often says that, you know, if you gave Orson Welles a iPhone, he would make an incredible phone, he would make an incredible film with that. Mm -hmm. But that there isn't a guarantee that because you have an iPhone, you can make a film with Orson Welles, I suppose. And so, oh. so and, and I think you, you, you make a kind of similar comparison when you're, you know, you're talking about... Um, you make this nice comparison with the Stradivarius and you kind of say that, you know, in some ways, if you take a really great musician, it doesn't necessarily matter what they're playing on. I mean, they can be playing on a Stradivarius, they can be playing on a kind of 20 pound violin, mm -hmm. it'll sound great, but it's, it's, so I guess the question is then is how do we teach that level of, and you talk a lot about seriousness of purpose mm -hmm. in digital filmmaking and that, you know, that, that kind of, that level of intention mm. and you know how do we then look to kind of teach that level of intention so um you know you can pick up your iphone and you can do something really interesting with it because a lot of the a lot of the iphone footage that i find myself watching is is sort of yeah. you know you hold it around about eye level and it kind of wanders around and it's not really composed and you know it's it's sure. the technology is there but not necessarily that seriousness of intention that you talk about and the problem the issue not the problem you know the fact the issue is that you know i saw a lot of student work that i've watched you know like makes me really chuckle because you know the end credit roller is like a work of art you know it's just like wow 400 people helped in the making of this film and i want to thank my uncle john and you know this Sandra, this would never have been possible without you. It's just like the impersonation of the Hollywood roller has become a big thing. So the end credits were the most important thing in the film, and as long often as the film, you know. So the fact, once we got, you know, final cut, and, you know, and I'm using, um, you, know, uh, you know, the other one now, and um, I've even found one on my uh, iPad that's, that's fantastic for editing, you know, that I really, really like. It's called Fusion, I think. It's really good. So anybody can make a pro-looking film. You can slow stuff down. You can do mixes. You can do dissolves. You know, so everything looks pro in terms of that. You know, literally the the beginning to the end of the flow of that image. You know, the content is absolutely banal and vacuous. But it, you know, so technology has invited people to worship the false god of the image. You know um which of course has opened the door to anybody you know i'm just going youtube i mean you know i go on youtube a lot because you know if i'm editing I go, well how do you do that again and i have to kind of check something and you've got to sit through like somebody's like website as they hey guys this is jay i'm going to tell you how to do that on the premiere pro you know and let you show and i'm going to show you my film to demonstrate how how you do this, you know, and and and, and sort of three quarters away, and he actually tells you it's that button. And it's all I wanted to know, right? But everybody's a filmmaker, and and ninety nine point nine percent of it is absolute garbage. Of course, why not? You know, what happened before, which is not a better system, but had a better result, was that to get into the club was really difficult. You know, to get hold of a camera, to buy film, to pay for the developing. 
and the editing and to understand all those techniques which were mechanical time consuming and quite com you know physically quite complicated meant that you'd have to have the most amazing kind of patience to get just to get to the point where you actually got to shoot a 10 minute film you know um, on any medium eight millimeter standard or super 16 let's say you know those would be the choices and even early video editing was incredibly complicated right so by definition, by the time you got to make a film, those who had survived the minefield just to get that far probably were aesthetically and let's say in an in a, in a educated manner in a better position to actually start making films. They would have had to have learned a lot of stuff, you know, and watched a lot of films and all the rest of it. Now, it, that is not thought of as being necessary. So sadly, what, what we now miss are the wonderful complex but beautiful set of rules that have been established since the beginning of moving cinema images about when to move a camera the hitchcock stuff you know how to use sound um in other words something that came to a, like a peak of perfection in something like eight and a half or or a bergman film or goddard when it was on fire or or, or altman or you know the masters of cinema you know and they had all had quite a journey to get there. By the time they're making The Godfather or Eight and a Half, they really, they really know about the language of camera movement and all of that. They have studied. They've, been, they've spent their entire life thinking about this. And there's nothing casual about it. And they probably don't want to be the cinematographer. They, they've got someone really good to shoot it. And they've got Walter Murch. And, you know, also people have spent an entire lifetime thinking about the aesthetic rules of how to tell a story with film, you know. So that's gone missing, unfortunately, unless you are, you know, the one in a thousand. And I meet them once in a bloom when I meet them, a student who actually has thought about it. And actually, but like anything, like any poet, like any painter, I know, you know, my friend uh, Paul Oster is a great writer. I was talking to him about, about teaching and, uh, you know, I say, What's the uh, attrition and success rate? He goes, well, you do like that. You've got a Brown or someone like some, you teach in some high-end college. I think this came up because David Foster Wallace writes about it too. And, you know, you have this enthusiastic class of students, right? And they all want to be Hemingway, they all want to be whatever, you know, or David Foster Wallace and or Paul Oster. And then you come back in 10 years' time, maybe five of them are still kind of trying to do it. You come back in 20 years time, maybe maybe one or two are still writing. Uh, and, and, and I think probably that's always been the rule. The truth is to be a great filmmaker, an artist, you've got to understand the medium so well. And you've also got to have a creative um, core to what, you know, you've got to have something to say. And then you've got to have the understanding of how a script works to know how to turn that into film language, you know? And I always have to say, with filmmaking, okay, writing a book is one thing, painting and things, but filmmaking, unless you actually understand how music works, unless you really understand how camera movement psychologically works, unless you understand how the script is not a novel, uh, it actually is a genre unto itself, a beautiful genre. You read a great script and it's like, wow, it's as good as a novel, but it's not a novel. It's not just turn the dialogue into, you know, into this format, you know, and then put stupid psychological things like she turns emotionally and tears gushing from her left ear, you know, it's just all that crap, you know. I mean, a great script would be super minimal. It would just have the right amount of information so everybody who's working on it kind of gets it and there's room for the actor then to do some wonderful thing. So the understanding of all those separate genres that combine into the genre known as filmmaking. So my education, I studied music. I was an actor for 10, 15 years. Um, I began writing scripts when I started making my own films and learning kind of from the ground up, but I already understood film in a way, I understood movement and I understood how the actors worked. Um, then film score, of course, because I'd studied music and then learning that, and because let's say, I think of myself as a kind of auteur, 
I have no problem killing the writer or killing the director when I'm in post-production because the most important thing is going to be the edit. Because if you do a screening and the, you know 10 people go to the toilet in the scene that you love, you have to listen to that. And there are two possibilities. One is it's not, it's not as good as you thought it was. But more profoundly, it may be as good as you think it is, but it's just in the wrong position in the film. It's following another scene that's very slow. So you need to, you need to put a car crash in or something so the audience can actually love it the way you love it. So unless you understand and you are prepared to kill the, the other personalities that you've so lovingly developed, <laughs> but the, the killing your children thing is very important because preciousness will never work for you as a filmmaker. I mean, it's not like a novel where you can have a break and pick up, pick book up tomorrow because it, you know, you've just made you tired or something. Film is designed to be watched in more or less in one lump, like we're talking about feature filmmaking, of course, that, and we'll come to serial or whatever later, and short film, but, you know, the truth, the truth is in that first screening and it's like, wow, man, what a revelation. And up until that point, Actually, you know nothing, you know, and that's when that's when the sharp end of all that, <laughs> all that knowledge and labor of love and effort and thing all comes to like a they went to the toilet, you know, uh, moment of truth, you know. Thank you, Mike. And maybe we could kind of pick up a little bit. You see, you mentioned camera movement a couple of times there, yeah. which is something that you you write about very lucidly in digital filmmaking. You talk about um, the evolution of cinema kind of starting off as this very proscenium, you know, the camera is effectively static and in the kind of pole position in the audience and you see what's on stage and then, but then there's that evolution where the camera starts to move and, and, wow. and you, you and you say that you say very powerfully that in some ways that is the moment when cinema is born is when the is when the camera starts to yeah. become part of the action rather than just simply a kind of a way of replicating theater somehow mm -hmm. Um, but you then write very persuasively about how you feel and this was obviously you writing in uh, 2007 but I'm sure that the same could be said now in 2022 that um, that you feel that there has been almost this addiction to camera movement and, yeah. and you know camera movement and films becoming so saturated with camera movement that that it's evident that the filmmakers aren't asking themselves why are they moving which again goes back to that question of intention mm -hmm. you know you know and, and that, that which underlies the decisions that you make as a filmmaker and so i wondered if you could talk a little bit about that Mike, in terms of your philosophy of yeah. camera movement, I suppose. Well, uh, let's begin with a joke. You know, why does a dog lick its bollocks? You know, answer because it can. You know, <laughs> you know, why why do we get camera movement? Because it because you can now. You know, so you can get a little steady cam like this with your iPhone, right? And of course, it's addictive. In the same way that when the, you buy your first zoom lens. Why is it that most of the photographs you take are on the sharp end of the zoom? They're on, they're on the close-up. You know, why don't you just buy a long lens? You know, so um, the sort of almost like sexual attraction <laughs> of the zoom, you know, and of whatever is like it's like hmm, it's that toy. You just got to somehow like fiddle with it, you know. And so the art of making a film is not doing that. It's like, you, you know, you have it as your reserve. If you want to, you can, you can, you know. I gave the example, I think in one of the books, because it, it made such an impact on me, although I didn't know why at the time, because I was very young. But my granny's house, one of the first films I ever saw was The Spiral Staircase, the original, you know. And I believe, and I could have invented this, but I believe there's a shot in it at the beginning where the there's a blind woman and she's, got her back to the camera and she's um, brushing her hair and there's a serial killer. And there's something about the framing of the shot. So there's a slight blurring, I, I remember, on the edge of the frame. And, you, and, and there must be some music stuff happening too. Like, you know, um, you know that's not good. You know, that's a kind of voyeuristic and she's, the camera's behind her as well. And she's looking in a mirror, but she's blind, so she can't see, right? 
and I and I think what happens then is the camera suddenly starts to zoom forward, you know, and 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 we fade out, and then you know she's dead, and that to me would be even if it didn't happen in the film, I would still say that's a great example of when to move the camera and how to frame. And it didn't move for a long time, but when it did move, you, you, you kind of go, oh, this is not good. So you've reserved that camera movement, which every uh, horror filmmaker, you know, worth of salt has then exploited along with the composer. Combination of creepy music and that kind of, you know, voyeuristic camera is always going to make people scared, you know. So those tricks, when they're held in reserve, as with a Hitchcock or a Polanski or a really master and uh, someone who really understands camera and film, they become so powerful. The problem then, you know, once we had, you know, like, uh, you know, the kind of MTV style editing, you know, just cutting up rock videos into like, you know, one second flash things. And I think the kind of both, and you look at the way score is used now, it's exactly the same thing. Going back to it's a film business, the paranoia about a film failing means the producers have the power to keep, like the shark, you mustn't follow, you know, you can't close your eyes because then the shark will die. It has to keep moving. And the same attitude towards the film, if the audience, you know, my God, something you might want to go to the toilet there, you know. Well, they're going to go to the toilet because they're eating popcorn and drinking gallons of sugar. So they're going to have to piss at some point, but maybe not now. And um, so this paranoia. Like, you know, bring John Williams in, it's got to be louder, you know, and, you know, just keep cutting there and keep moving. So a kind of massively superficial attempt to give the idea that something's happening, even though nothing's happening, except the same old garbage that you saw before, you know. So as we get to the hundredth repeat of that same plot point and that same genre, you know, the desperate desire to come up with some different way of branding it, you know, by doing something, you know, I don't know. So all those techniques that then came up, like the 360 degree freeze and, you know, you know, the cameras in a circle and, you know, steady cam, of course, you know, and everyone talks about good fellas and this one shot and it's just, it became like a kind of a sport, you know, cinema, because people also became fascinated by making of films. So the, the, the interest in film as a genre in itself then lends the idea that the tricks of almost like, oh, how did the magician do that trick? You know? So we now know how every stunt is done with there's nothing, there's nothing sacred you know, to anything. So we know, in a sense, we're now at the point where we need to fall actually back on drama and storytelling because there's nothing left to sell in terms of gimmick. There is literally nothing left. I mean, smelly, smelly cam, 3D, you know, virtual, this, you know, immersive cinema. It's all, it's all just desperation. Meanwhile, we had COVID and we decided we didn't need cinemas anymore. You know, so you know, we've got a I mean, the audience now. I mean, you, we have got a challenge, a good one, which is how do you reinvent? Uh, cinema in such a way that you're getting you're going to get the audience to come back because they want to hear more stories. They don't want to see more tricks, I don't think. Thank you, Mike. And it's very interesting what you're saying there about um, creative restraint in terms of, you know, having to have a very good reason to move the camera. And you, you go on to talk about this very eloquently as well when it uh, with regard to, to music. And, and you, I'm going to quote here from the book, you say, if you don't put any music on your film, then after a while, people don't miss it. The minute you put 30 seconds of music onto the film, it's almost as if you've crossed a line that you can't reverse. The audience will expect more music. And it's a problem of addiction. The more music you put in, the more demanding it becomes. In order to maintain any sense of excitement, you constantly have to increase the amount of music to a disproportionate degree. Instead, I would say that the use of music should be minimal or sparing. And I think it's interesting to reflect on that in terms of cinema more generally, in terms of, you know, the powerful devices of cinema. I mean, so, for example, you know, I was watching a John Ford uh, film recently. They were expendable. And I was really struck by how few close-ups he used. Yeah. But whenever he used a close-up, it would smack you in the face. It had, it had a real impact act because he was saving it for that that one moment and, and another example of this sort of thing would be a more recent film um sean baker's red rocket i don't know if you've seen that one mike but 
But it, again, in that film, <clears throat> Baker kind of holds back the point of view shot. There's very few point of view shots, but when he uses one, it, it, it's used with such emphasis. And and and, it, and you, you know, you've talked about Hitchcock and you know, some of those masterful kind of Hitchcock kind of camera moves and uh, like that zoom in and notorious onto the key the key and and Hitchcock will only uh, Hitchcock will only ever do that once or twice mm. film you know it's it's and it kind of points to this kind of the importance of restraint I suppose mm. you know whether it's camera movement whether it's music whether it's a close-up yeah. but you know learning to to save the kind of the special tools for the moments that really warrant them I suppose I mean it's <laughs> To give two examples, you talk about John Ford, right? The kind of filmmaker who who is telling an epic story and is interested in landscape, you know, in a, in a major way, the American landscape. Um, so the use of a close-up would be like quite a shot, you know. In the book, at the very beginning, I give a quote from Bergman, uh, who to me summed up my interest in cinema totally. Like, the, so the question was. What's the difference between theater and cinema? Um, and his answer was the close up, you know, cinema is the ongoing exploration of the human face. I'm like, oh, that's it, that's it. I'm a portraitist. Yeah, I'm fascinated by faces. So I'm fascinated by on a big screen, what can happen to a face when asked a question where you have to lie, you know, or deny love or conceal regret or, or tragedy, you know? So how do you hold tears back? How do you do this, you know? So I would sort of say, don't cry. Want to cry, but don't cry. I and mean, that was, I learned from Albert Finney, you know, in the Browning version. Uh, Ridley Scott, the producer, wanted him to cry every scene. He went, well, when I cry in the big scene, it's not gonna have much impact. I went, yes, you're quite right. Sorry, sorry, Albert, you're right, I'm wrong. Well, Ridley's wrong. And um, so, but you look at Bergman. So if you look at the, uh, in uh, 36 Dramatic Situations, I, I think I analyzed 150 films to see in each film, how many of the situations of the 36 they use. So something like Raiders of the Lost Ark, maybe use 22, because it's, you know, episodic and, they, you know, a new device, a new device, because it's, it's an adventure story, right? And they'll use things in a kind of passing way as a device. Bergman would use very, very few, and he'd be much more interested in this kind of like very cruel portraits of faces. So he then worked with a cameraman called Sven Nuqvist, who was kind of a, a pioneering genius because Sven invented, I think, what I call the creeping zoom. So back in the day, you'd have a thing called a microforce, which was a controllable device that you fixed onto a zoom camera, and you could set it at 0 0.1, whatever, and tell it to zoom as slowly as it could over 10 minutes. So at the beginning of the scene, maybe one take, you're in a, like you are now, a medium shot where I can see your shoulders, your whole head and your bookcase. At the end of the 10 minute take, I'd be in a really tight shot on your face, you know? And, but the audience wouldn't have been aware in the front part of their brain that the camera was moving or zooming. And it was a zoom, not a track, so there was no instability movement. What I call, if you track on a, on a camera, it's like a jumbo jet, you know, you, you look at the wingtips and they're, they're really moving, you know, you feel like you're in the middle of the plane, you're okay. But if you look at the edge of the frame on a, on a big cinema, you'll see that instability if it's a tracking shot, even on the smoothest track. However, on a, on a controlled zoom, there is no instability. It's cold, it's Swedish, it's Sven. And, uh, but the audience will get an uneasy feeling in their stomach, in the pit of their stomach, even though they haven't clocked that the camera is zooming. And if you've got a really cool composer, he will be using maybe a low frequency or something like that. Again, just really on the margin of, of the oral perception of the soundtrack, that will also be making you a little bit disturbed. You know, So by the time we get to the end of that 10 minute scene, which I'm making up in my head, you know, the audience's guts are with you, you know, and you, you apparently haven't moved anything or played a sonata or, or John Williams hasn't appeared and, you know, and no one steady cammed anything, you know. So 
there's one style, one genre, which one could they let's say, oh, I can learn from that. Wow, what, a, what an amazing education that would be. If you add to that, let's say, let's take the film Persona. Now this I'll share with you because nobody else knows this. I was watching Persona one day because I was transcribing something for a performance piece. I wanted to take a section of that film of the dialogue. And there's a scene where I think one of the women is sitting in a car reading a letter. And I was thinking, well, that's really odd. The soundtrack's really odd. I can hear the rustling of the paper. I can hear the rain on the window, but I can't hear any what we call room tone or white noise or bird song or ambience. It's really strange. It's almost like he's post-produced the sound here, but it's so perfect. But I'm aware of what I can't hear because I'm used to it in on the sound guy. I started researching and I started asking people, was Persona post-dub? No, I don't think so. You know, I have a very well-known critic. I don't think so, Mike. And then I tracked down an interview, I think, with Liv Orman. Liv, who was in that? And basically, she said, you know, the film was very difficult to make, but not as difficult as the post-production, because Ingmar wanted us to loop every line in the film. And I went, wow the control freak of all control freaks, as in a great filmmaker, but that's what you are. He wanted to control every aspect of his film, including the sound. So he says exactly what he wants you to hear on any given scene. If he wants the sound of waves, he'll control that. It won't be arbitrarily recorded on a beautiful Nagra or something like that. And I went, wow, there's an education in just the Ingmar Bergman approach. And then you look at John Ford, or Francis Coppola or something like that. Much more interested in innovation, let's say, with Coppola or John Ford. He has like, he has that, that vision you talked about, you know, where some, the impact of a close-up because it's so rare, but he would never use a creeping zoom. There's no time. And you can't creep zoom, you know, on a bunch of cavalrymen, you know, doing their thing. So the education is, so let's say, the Tarantino way is you, you choose a filmmaker, and then you, and in the same way, like if you're interested in photography and you love Cartier-Bresson, let's say, you, you get five of his photographs and then you get a pencil and you kind of go, where's the light coming from? You stick it on a piece of paper. Where's the light source? Why is this dark? Why is this an interesting photograph? And it's to do with his choice of light. And he didn't crop it because his, his thing was, his mantra was, I, I make the frame and I stick to the frame. Now, I have mixed feelings about that. You can now with, with 4K, you can create, you know, I, I interviewed Walter March two years ago. He was cutting a film shot on 4K and he was getting three, three shots out of one shot, you know, three singles, you know, and then the wide shot. And he's like, man, it's great. The quality hasn't dropped. I'm, I'm more than happy. But each one is like a kind of, it's not arbitrary. These people have arrived at an understanding, very personal, like any painter. Is he a quantalist? Is he an impressionist? Is he abstract realist? Is he this, you know? And then how did they get, what was their journey that got them to there? And you can learn from that. So the education part of it, you don't have to go to film school, but you do have to think about what you're doing. It can't just be it waft around with, with a, you know, with a steady can. It's, it's not good enough, you know? Yeah, and I mean, in, in a jazz context, I guess the example would be that you you take the solo of someone that you love and you transcribe it and you pick it apart and you learn to play it yourself and then you can yeah. inhabit it, I suppose, to an extent. Yeah, yeah, you kind of go, which I have done many times, slow it down at least to half speed. It's Charlie Parker or Henry or Coltrane, you know, even if it's just two phrases, I was like, wow, that's a G minor chord and they're playing, oh, wow, oh, I, see. I see. And then that kind of goes in, becomes part of your language. You don't want to copy them. Like so many jazz musicians will just basically, you know, splurge Coltrane. I mean, he became, you know, everybody's influence, of course, you know. Very hard to move on from Coltrane now, you know. But there were other players around, like, you know, Dolphin, people like that are not, you know, you can learn from, and also, if you're learning from Coltrane, you have to learn from Louis Armstrong. And you actually need to reference Taylor and Morton and Bessie Smith, because they're, they are part of that journey. In the same way, Bergman, John Ford, you don't just go, I only like modern jazz. It's like, you know, that's boring. Yeah. 
One of the things that John Sales was was talking about last night is that you know one of the ways in which he learned, and as you say, it's it's not a film school thing. It's something that you do on your own, on your own steam, on your own time. Uh, but that he would he would watch a film once for himself, and he would let it kind of wash over him, and that would you know be him watching as an audience. And then if there was something that really struck him about that film, then he would he would watch it again. Yeah, yeah. Uh, but he would he would as a little bit like you're saying with Charlie Parker, where you kind of where you have to slow it down. Yeah, I mean, I mean, film's great for that. I mean, I, when I did Liebestraum, I had to do a stunt where something falls off the top of a building, and I um, I got a video of Don't Look Now of the scene where uh, things fall off scaffolding, right? Um, and, that, and there's a build up to this accident, and I literally went, you know, cut by cut. So, how did Nick Rogue? arrive at that sequence, you know, and I copied it actually. I mean, I had to adapt it to my scenario, but I went, that, that really works, I see, you know, and that that kind of, that's a sort of classical language thing in film. Now they're like, you know, how do, how do you set up a stunt, you know? So the audience is already nervous about it, you know, and is it it's a combination of angles and details and, you know, the close up of the thing loosening or whatever, you know, I can't remember. And then it falls, you know. So, uh, I mean, it's fantastic in the sense that the universal school of cinema is that you know, download or just get a hold of, which is really a piece of cake these days. Any movie you like, choose a scene and break it down, you know, on every level. How did the script work there? And if you can even get hold of the script, which again, not impossible, you know. Uh, it, it's always interesting. Can you get the shooting script and see what they then did to the, to, you know, what got cut out in the edit or in the shooting and so on. So, uh, you know, I mean, if you love it, it's, it's, it, it's not difficult to educate yourself if you really love it, you know. It's easier than music, for sure. You don't have to practice, and, you know. <laughs> yeah, no, when, when, I remember when I started at the London Film School, um, Mike Lee, who himself studied at the London Film School yeah. a couple of decades before, gave the opening speech, and he said that really, when he was at the London Film School, he actually feel that his 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 education came first and foremost from the kind of repertory screenings at the BFI. It was yeah. just, it was just uh -huh. sitting, watching films, and kind of immersing himself in. And I think sometimes it, it's something that that that. I really so I teach I teach film at the Edinburgh College of Art and documentary in particular, but I'm constantly encouraging our students to try and work out where they want to place themselves yeah. in that. Whether you think of it as a genealogy or a map, you know where exactly you want to. Because I think that there's this danger in film schools that you can, you know, you're in a, you you can kind of seal yourself off hermetically and thinking that you're in reinventing the wheel for the first time, whereas you know kind of in and so I guess that that that, as you say, Mike, I think being able to plug yourself into that kind of enormous river of film culture, is is one of the best ways to learn. I think it is. It is, and I mean, the best way to learn is to actually go and make a ten minute film, and, and just see how bad you are, and then make a better one, and then see how you've improved, but you're still crap, and then make another one, and then you kind of go, I'm starting to get it now. Because there's no reason why you should you know, make a great film straight away. I mean, it's too much to learn. And the only way to learn is to make a bad one and to make some mistakes. And so uh, I find one of the big faults is that people, you know, take too long to develop ideas. You know, so one of the things that really concerns me right now is, is, is the PC culture um, in the sense that, you know, it's, it's long overdue, of course, the whole, you know, leveling of the playing field and, 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 you know, it's always been a horribly exclusive, snobbery based, nasty little club. And now it's not, which is great. So that's the good news. The bad news is that I feel a real sympathy for, for young filmmakers who I think feel compelled to have to make political statements every time they turn a camera on, as opposed to telling good stories. Because ultimately, there is only one truth, which is that filmmaking is an incredibly wonderful, advanced form of storytelling that has evolved quite naturally because we like stories. 
Why do we like stories? Because we need to share psychologically emotional experience with each other to prepare ourselves for death, if, you know, if I'm going to be blunt. The death of our friends, the death of ourselves. The big question is, you know, is there is anybody out there? Uh, was it, is there any meaning to our existence on these? So, that, you know, the Greeks kind of very cleverly said, you know, let's, let's do this thing called drama and we'll discuss it in a public forum. And then we can chat about it afterwards and kind of go, that was interesting. I see myself in that character. We've lost that completely. We've lost the plot completely right now. So because of the, let's say, social politics of, as I say, long overdue, but there is a danger that then that takes over the role of storytelling because it's not storytelling. That's actually propaganda. So um, it's okay to bring propaganda into a story because you've got to have a point of view. But let's think about the cart and the horse and which is pulling. At the moment, the cart is definitely pulling the horse, you know, and it's the wrong way around. So when I wrote the 36 dramatic situations and I came up with this idea of cards so you could use chance, the idea was to kickstart you, the writer, out of your pathetic memory syndrome. Like, oh, I was so uh, had a terrible childhood, you know, I, I wanted an ice cream and my, my grandmother wouldn't give it to me and I somehow it, it scarred me for life and now I'm a, you know, a gambler. I've gambled in the dictionaries because of the ice cream. Just, no, it's not. It's, that's a boring story, by the way, so move on. Can't you think of a better story, a, a universal story, because not that many people are going to be interested in you as a three-year-old with ice cream, really not. That's really limited your audience. Do you want to do that? So why don't you tell, why don't you think about Shakespeare and tell a bigger story? So the idea is you choose three cards. It'll give you some major options about loss of a loved one, rivalry, coincidence, whatever, and then go, okay, use your imagination now and start inventing a story because sooner or later your dna is going to come into that and maybe the ice cream with the grandmother is also going to come into that you'll find an opportunity somewhere but just don't make the film about the ice cream make that a kind of comedy scene later on or something like that you can bring your own dna and that's fine that's you you're an individual but do not dwell on your own boring past my boring past you know it's like be universal. Cinema is the universal language. I mean, the great story about Ellis Island, you know, the, 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 the center of America where the immigrants had to filter through that before they became American, right? It's an island just off New York, you know. At any given point in the 1880s, there would be 30 different nationalities on that island, right? They would all watch together silent cinema with musical accompaniment, right? That may be a little later than 1880, I mean, that's whatever the dates would be. They would all universally enjoy the same movie, right? Cut to later on, just before Ellis Island, you know, stopped being this kind of clearinghouse and then and talkies were in, right? At which point you've marginalized your audience down to anybody speak English, you know? So uh, a really interesting example of, the silent movie was universal, you know, could be seen in any part of the world. And if there was a kind of common human truth there, it would be evident to someone in Afghanistan, someone in Caracas, someone in wherever. So cinema still has that power, you know, but it's become this parochial, like, you know, eating itself, you know, um, I think propaganda tool, and I really worry about that. You know, I worry about the output from a lot of, a lot of young filmmakers, and and some of it's really good filmmaking. But I feel that they are under pressure to to, to toe that line, and I think you know, and I think there's a lot of pressure in, in schools and all the rest of it. And like I say, just to qualify that, I think it's an essential part of our progress, but it shouldn't be. It's not. It's not the horse, it's the cart, you know, I mean, so the horse has to be the desire to share universally understandable psychological statements about our reality and our existence, you know. Cinema is important. If I could ask another question about the, the 36 dramatic situations, which is um, another of Mike's books, folks, which is a slightly more recent book. Uh, one of the things that was really interesting to me about this, Mike, is that is you know you mentioned chance there, and you talk about the I Ching in the book, and and it made me think of uh, 
it made me think of a number of things. It made me think, I don't know if you're aware of Brian Eno's oblique strategies. Oh, yeah. mm. and, and it also made me think of actually something that I, I you mentioned Walter Murch earlier, that I, I read Walter Murch talking about how, I think in kind of older editing systems, you would, would back when you were kind of actually cutting film and they had these rolls of film, mm. the way I think it was the KEM system worked is that you, you'd have rolls of film would randomly put be put up against each other and and so there was a degree of kind of almost randomization mm -hmm. built into the process and and it kind of touches upon this notion that that um and i think you put this very nicely when when you you wrote uh whenever i write a story there's a certain point when i get bogged down i find the possibilities diminish as i progressively become the victim of a combination of the three act structure and my own limited human experiences and I think there's this interesting notion there about, and I find it myself when I'm making a film, and that somehow my ideas are always a little bit limited, mm. you know, and, and almost kind of looking for ways to bring in a bit of chance or a bit of, yeah. you know, the, the provocation of difference. And so often, often that comes from collaboration, of course, is, you know, working well, with That's others. an interesting point because, for example, you know, let's say these days you can be the author, you shot the film, and, and now you're probably editing it. For both personal and economic reasons, you're on, you know, you only need a Final Cut Pro, whatever you want. And, you know, and you do get bogged down. You go, oh, God, it's kind of a little bit boring, you know. I mean, it's okay, but I feel, I don't, I don't feel this kind of energy now, you know. So I play in this free jazz group, and now it's a quartet. And we've just, as I say, just done this album. And one of the most remarkable things, because free music, you, you're not playing to a structure. However, we've played together all our adult lives. So I know then, you know, George Kahn plays the saxophone. I kind of know his language, you know. And Terry, the percussionist, he doesn't play time, but he plays multi-time, right? And the bass player, you know, so we pick up on each other all the time. So if, I, if I'm playing trumpet or something, and I'm you know, kind of in on my Miles Davis reverie at this point, could be that George will kind of go, fuck that, that's kind of, you know, and he'll fart across it or something like that. And he'll, he'll play a phrase and I kind of, oh, that's pretty good. And I'll respond to that. So I have the luxury in a quartet of, of having collaborators who, who monitor the boredom factor, if you like. Okay, that's, that's gone on for long enough. Um, let's move this in a different direction. They won't destroy what I'm doing, but they'll suggest a different path. Filmmaking, unfortunately, you know, it's just you and you. So when I, um, one second, Tara, yes. could you bring me out some cards? Yeah. Thanks. So, uh, yeah. So when I first, you know, the, the history of this was I wrote the book. There are 36 chapters because there are 36 possibilities. And I ended up with 36 postcards, at which point I thought, well, and I was in my mind, thinking, that's interesting. You know, I always loved the I Ching. I love chance, you know. So long story short, um, we then made our own, um, you know, cards. Here they are. This is uh, what they look like. Okay. And so there are 36 cards. So each card is a chapter in the book. So you have things like self-sacrifice for family, everything sacrificed for passion, disaster, ambition, self-sacrifice for idealism, deliverance, which is, you know, um, unexpected things, something, you know, you're about to be hanged and then suddenly we said, you've been pardoned, you're free to go. The discovery of the dishonor of a loved one, epic, you know, like what drama would be complete. I mean, so you start thinking, oh, Othello, you know, you can't keep them Shakespeare, Shakespeare, you know, or the Bible, obstacles to love, oh, Romeo and Juliet, excuse me, you know, rivalry of kinsmen, Shakespeare, you know, uh, loss of a loved one well you know whatever uh the necessity of sacrificing loved ones sophie's choice you know so you have these kind of like and i tested them i literally like to destruction these things right analyzing 150 movies and uh, you know i changed one or two things from the original version written in 1880s but they were still like you know that's pretty sound you know so let's say I'm now bored, as you, see, you know, we're at that point where like, ah, I'm on the script and it's like, ah, it's a bit boring, you know. So I thought one day I'll test it. So I get my cards and I, you know, normally I say take three and that's your story. So I thought I'll just take one. And I'm, you know, so what would that be? And so it's like, oh, it says recovery of a lost one. 
And I, I, it's kind of all the headings from the chapters. So suspense, fragility, emotion, enigma, caution, suspicion, a family divided by disaster tries to reconnect. A child tries to find missing parents, adoption issues, etc. A search for a person who will otherwise die, a ticking clock. A non-believer is brought back into the group of a family, positive. A rebel is brainwashed back into a group, negative, you know. So you can come back to us, Brother John, as long as you, or you have, you know, like one flew of the cuckoo's nest. And he's, you know, he sort of seems to have been lobotomized at the end, you know, whatever. So, you know, I've got that note. So I'd start thinking, oh, whole train of thought, you know, and what did I respond to? Ticking clock, search for a person, otherwise they're going to die. Every thriller, right? And it's an enigma. Where do we start? Well, there's plenty of work to do there. You know, I can think of a whole scenario just in that, right? That could be the film. And so now I'm not thinking about my ice cream tragedy with my grandmother, you know, you know, and how that made me whatever later on. I'm thinking about story and I'm tapping into Dostoevsky, James Bond, the vast, you know, plethora of stories that I've seen in my life, you know, from which we always steal. You know. They're not, it's not stealing, it's like repurposing, you know, because there are limited number, he says 36, you know. Um, and so what I'm encouraging people to go is like, you know, come on, jump out of your, your little rabbit hole of, you know, poor me. Uh, you know, I always want to say like, up until the time of the Beatles, nobody wrote their own songs. Frank Sinatra, I don't think Frank Sinatra ever wrote a song. Billie Holiday wrote two that I know of. No, they're nice, but you know, all the ones I remember were not written, they were written by Cole Porter and all kinds of people like that. Um, Art Tatum didn't write any songs, you know. Charlie Parker wrote some tunes, but he's not remembered for the, for his tunes, you know. So then the Beatles came in and they, you know, they were like musical auteurs. And then after that, everybody had to be a singer-songwriter to this day, right? We we were like, we've never turned back. And you think about it. There's maybe one or two tracks on an album that are quite good, and the rest are kind of like, I wish they'd done some covers or something, you know, um, because that's their main, you know, they earn money from from their from their royalties from some songwriting, but it hasn't really done favors. I still prefer Cole Porter or Gershwin or whatever, you know, or whoever, or the Beatles, because they were good songwriters. That's the problem. Thank you, Mike. Folks, we're coming. We've got about twenty minutes left with Mike, and I'm, I mean, I still have lots of questions that I'd like to ask Mike. But um, this is a good moment if anyone would like to start feeding uh, questions into the chat. Or, uh, oh, actually, sorry, we have a question already, which is from one of my students who says, "Dear Mike, I'm a film directing student. Uh, I really love leaving Las Vegas. When I was young." and I have struggled with camera movement most of the time when studying documentary here. When using the camera, do you trust your intuition uh, or your rationality after careful consideration? Or is it both? Uh, I feel sometimes my film education is quite conflicting. Sometimes I need to learn those cinematic languages which aren't uh, my cognition. Uh, when my professor says cliche is dangerous, but if the cliche is something that I really felt in life, something similar to the despair that I felt when I watched Leaving Las Vegas. So I guess it's a question about how, when you're thinking about <clears throat> camera movement, Mike, how are you, where does it come from? Where does that intuition, is it rational, is it instinctual? Yeah. Well, I think there's, there's a couple of answers and I'll try and kind of synthesize it a little bit. So uh, the liberation for me came after Hollywood with Leading Las Vegas. So I did a film just before Vegas called Browning Version, lovely DP called uh, Jean-Francois Robin. He had shot Betty Blue, uh, he's a fantastic cameraman and a, and a wonderful human being. So we were doing like very formal English public school, Terence Rattigan, you know, so it had, a, it had a kind of, you know, vibe to it. And we're doing a big scene in, in the chapel and we were shooting two cameras and, um, and then Jean-Francois said, oh, you should uh, operate the second camera. I went, oh, no, 35 millimeter. And it's got these like, you know, big twirly things. And it's like, I was kind of intimidated. He said, oh, my not so difficult. I'll show you. Give me a quick lesson on the twirlies, you know. And uh, 
as soon as I put my eye to that eyepiece, I went, oh, bingo. This is filmmaking. I need that content. Up until then, I'd kind of been, I didn't realize it, been so frustrated by the fact that the actors were always talking to the cameraman because they had direct, that's who they were, that's who they were performing for. And I was watching TV on some crappy monitor, right? The minute I started to shoot and I went, no, fuck that, no more. So got out the Super 16 camera and then with Declan Quinn, lovely man who agreed to a two camera setup. So on leaving Las Vegas, this is what happened. Declan did the A camera. So he did the kind of, you know, he lit for the main shot. I then just kind of walked around. I'm like, yeah, that's nice. I like the way the light, the light's kind of more profiling here because I'm off to the side. So I'm going to do that. And I have a zoom um, on my camera so I could find my own kind of focal length. And then I literally would do Zen. I'd written the script, so I kind of know what's going on in the scene. And a lot of DPs don't. And I realize that's an important thing. So I'm on Elizabeth's shoe or I'm on Nick, and I kind of know what I've told them to do in this scene. And so I would be quite tight and I'd go down and I'd find a hand. I know that she's going to drink. I'll take that to bring me back up to the face. And I would, I would go into unconscious Zen operating like that. Um, I'm maybe about to do something which I'm very excited about, which is Francis Ford Coppola is about to make, I think, his last film. And he's paying for it himself. It's a big movie. He and I have been sort of friends for quite a long time. He's always been very kind to me. He's a, he's a great guy. And I have offered myself as a documentary filmmaker to Coppola, you know. And I can think of no greater pleasure than being a fly on the wall. Because I love the fly on the wall role because you don't have a responsibility for the script. The only responsibility you have is to really know, focus on what's going on, and then single camera, try and get it in a kind of graceful way. So I would sort of say, if you want to learn camera, just practice dancing with the camera. I don't mean on a steady cam, do it on a tripod, or do it on something like a fig rig where you can have control of, it's not too jerky, but try and, Try and, try and find a grace in the way that you move that has a kind of connection with the emotion of the scene. Uh, and that, that, that will be very specific. So I filmed a documentary about um, a piano competition in Hastings. Most amazing, amazing young international young pianists, like incredible technique. And I was this close to them, you know, in profile on the camera, just shooting on video. And, I, and then one pianist, this, this Korean woman, she was like crashing about, I just decided to crash with her to the hands, to the effects, to the hands. The, the other pianists who are doing Tchaikovsky or something, you kind of like, you, then the move has got to be much more graceful. But sometimes, so in other words, you just have to find this Zen way of connecting to what's physically going on. And once you connect into it, you don't think about it. It's like any sport. You know, tennis players don't think I'm going to do, uh, you know, this. They kind of, they're watching and they just, you know, they're in the right place. And, and camera work, great camera work, I think is, is the same. But you need to practice, same as if it was a sport. You need to really, and you need to love your camera. You need to, whether it's an iPhone or whatever, you need to be so connected to it. So, I mean, for the iPhone, I found this really like 10 quid plastic, two handles, basic thing it's amazing it's better than any steady camera or anything because you have the stability of two hands and it's it's fantastic or either um the iphone or gopro you know you really it's amazing you know and the same if you're going to shoot on your ipad you can buy a little thing with handles on it terry gilliam told me he's just you know he he was shooting a bunch of stuff on his ipad you know for, for the last film he did you know and he loved it because you've got this big monitor. I mean, it's, it's fantastic. You know, you can see exactly what you're shooting um, and, you've got, and you have the stability. Thank you, Mike. That's a very rich answer there. And it, it, listening to you talk there, it makes me think of something else that you've <coughs> written about very nicely in the book where you're talking, I guess, about camera placement. And I guess it goes back to that thing that you were saying about the development of 
cinema from this kind of proscenium facsimile of theatre to something where the camera is part of the action and 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 you say one of the things that you really need to consider is put yourself in the firing line mm. you know that and you say i am the camera and i am part of the scene now yeah and a sense that 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 and and it, it's great to kind of hear hear you talking about um operating yourself and you talk about the energy that particularly in drama when <coughs> you're you're working with actors and that sense of energy that seems to pass from them to you and from you to them and when you're actually in the scene with the camera i mean there's a great quote i did an interview with david lynch years ago at the camera image festival you know talking about he just done inland empire which he shot on a pd150 and he vowed never to go back to 35 ever again in his life. He said, I would rather die than go back to a film. You know, I love it. And I love those guys and all of that. But, you know, once you've held the camera yourself, and he quite rightly said, you're in a room with your two actors. You know, if you want more light, put another light bulb in, you know. So you you don't ever say cut. You've got one hour. You keep shooting. And then, so you do her to the camera. And you walk behind her and you do the reverse. And you're still in the mode and you're talking all the way through going, do it again, do it again. And I, I said, I, it's exactly what I do. That's what I did on hotel, you know? So this idea that it's not a question of like, oh, you know, screw film tradition. It's just like, if that's your thing, if that's the way you would like to make films, this is heaven because, you know, there is no interface between you and the actors. Now, most people like the interface because it's actually quite perverse to be in a room, just you and the actors. It almost feels weird because there's no action and cut, you know, and there's not all the people standing over there. Please be quiet, keep still while we're acting. There's no one there. And at that point, you kind of go, cinema's actually really weird, isn't it? It's perverse. It's a bit kinky. It's like, and then you really start thinking, why are we doing this? I mean, what is this all about? You know, they're pretending. I'm asking them to pretend to be these people who are in love or they hate each other, they kill each other, they just had sex, whatever. It's weird. But normally I would be a script supervisor, you know, I think, you know, we could do it again. The camera, I think a little bit soft there, God, no, you know, we, need, we should shoot it again. So you have all these kind of like, we need to go again. Okay, stand by and action, you know, and go. John, I really love you. And it's just like, you get rid of all of that and you go into the new world of, let's say, interactive filmmaking, proper interactive filmmaking, not the bullshit stuff. And either you love it. So to quote Diane Arbus, there is a line of perversity that exists in all situations, which if you cross it requires a great deal of courage, you know, and most people stop at the line and they pull back six inches. Diane Arbus crashed through. She was like, no, I'm, I, I want to cross the line of perversity. And so that line of perversity kind of filmmaking, you know, we, you know, dogma made that pretty clear, right? And, and I think, you know, Time Code and then Hotel and all the films I've subsequently made, you know, I've made a bunch of features with maybe three or four people and a bunch of short films with sometimes just me and the actors, sometimes just me and one actor. You know, and I'm exploring the idea of using Zoom now as a kind of, you know, as a, you know, which people have been using it, but as you know, you, you don't even need to be in the same place now. I mean, I could film you now, I could ask you to set up your iPhone so it's better quality and a decent microphone. And this is my monitor, but we're going to approximate this and I could direct you, you know, and then just say, uh, can you Dropbox that to me? I could have it in an hour if you were in Tokyo. So, I mean, that's kind of my, and now COVID has kind of opened those ideas up, right? Wow, is that where we're at now? Well, answer is yes, potentially, as well as everything else. So what a, what a crazy, wacky, interesting, perverse possibility we now have. Um, you know, and we take another card and our film is gonna be about self-sacrifice for idealism. That's what came up, off you go, let's go, you know, whatever. And does it have to have special effects? You know, I was talking to, my, to Paul Oster about for years about making a film. I said, can we do a film just where people describe something horrible that they've just done or that they're going to do? 
so that you know that almost Dostoevsky an idea of the weirdness after the killer then you know it's going through this kind of emotional state of what have I done why don't I feel more guilt you know like in that you know crime and it's a crime and punishment and uh, the really really dark one but I, you know yeah so where the novel got to in terms of internal mind thought cinema can also like you know, you know go you know because then we go to uh, Bergman's idea of the exploration of the human face while you tell that story you know um very interesting time and I you know going back to what you said earlier my worry is that when no one's really capitalizing on the potential right now for like mind-blowing innovation in cinema because the technology is all there that everything you'll ever need it's like we need to just jump out of our regressive examining of our own navel and start telling stories again one final question for you, Mike, which is from Aaron Carruthers, just before we wrap up. So Aaron, Aaron says, Stormy Monday is my favourite movie of yours, and it's a film I watch regularly, regularly because of its atmosphere and, and how you photograph Newcastle. I was wondering if there was any sequences that were cut from the final edit. Well, there must have been. Um, but it was a pretty lean, you know, it was a pretty lean um, production, so not not too much. By the time I had a very good producer, Nigel Safford Clark, I originally went to him with a script, and he said, "Mike, there are there are three movies in there. It's like typical first time directors, you know, like uh, you're frightened you might never get to make a film again. So all the three films you want to make all go into the same script." And it was, it was arty beyond belief. You know, he said, "I like the script that has this character running a jazz club." But the uh, the punks versus the rugby players, I don't know how that fits in. And uh, the Brian Ferry character, I don't know where that comes in. And it's like, okay, if you if you're prepared to do the one script, I'll produce it for you. And he was a super wise guy, you know. So I did, and then I had this great mentor called Bill, Bill Tennant who supported me through the whole thing. And then, you know, and then of course Roger Deakins to you know. Uh, not the easiest guy to work with, but wow, what a what a lighting cameraman, you know. Um, it looks amazing. It looks beautiful. Um, and, you know, by the way, there was talk of doing some kind of a series now, which I think would be real. I mean, I'd love to go back to Newcastle and shoot something really dark, you know, um, given the world situation and where Newcastle is and the Baltic and the whole thing. I think I think that could be so cool. Thank you so much, Mike. Um, well, I think if there's no final questions, I think we'll maybe start wrapping up there. I think I hope you'll all join me, everyone that's on the call, and just giving Mike a silent round of applause. It's been a <laughs> it's been a really inspiring session for me, Mike, and I'm sure for for others as well. It's been thank you so much for your generosity in terms of taking us into your your thoughts and your uh, that's people saying in the chat. Thank you very much, but it's. I'm struck, similar with John yesterday, I'm struck by, and you, you put this very nicely, I think, at the beginning of digital filmmaking when uh, there's a lot of clo closed doors, mm -hmm. I think, when you're a young filmmaker trying to kind of find your way and a lot of people who aren't willing to pass things on. And so I'm really struck by the generosity of folk like John and yourself who are willing to share these insights with us, you know, these kind of very rich experiences that you've gathered over your time, some of which I'm sure have been very hard won. You know, the, the one really important piece of advice I would give is that, you know, filmmaking is a club, you know, of course, it's Soho House, basically, right, you know, in various forms, you know, there's, there's, there's the Hollywood version, there's the London version, the British version, and so on, there's the BFI version, and, you know, so it's a bunch of clubs, right, and each one has a code, uh, and they, they like these kind of films, so it's almost like, you should be aware of what their dress code is before you go knock on their door. But meanwhile, the best way to avoid all of that is just go off and make a stunning 30 minute film yourself with, with three very carefully selected friends where you, you know, you demonstrate that you are a filmmaker. And then, you know, that's like, that gets you into all those clubs. Whereas if you try and get in and sort of like join the club very quickly, you'll be assimilated into the club and become a clone of the club. And that's, that's 
very limiting. You know, you don't really want to be a member of any of those clubs. It's just they're useful places to go and get stuff, distribution or money or actors or whatever. But ultimately, you know, you've got to, you've got to find your own voice. And so I urge all of you, uh, whoever is out there, uh, spread the word, you know, just do what the Nouvelle Vague did, which is get some smart mates together and make your own, like, make your own little Nouvelle Vague movie, you know, that, that acknowledges all the great stuff that you've absorbed, but also has kind of an original smell to it as well. And that's to, a kind of energy to it. You know, the energy gets very quickly dissipated in the clubs. It's tedious, you know, that it's really kind of numbingly tedious to be a member of the film community. So you've, it's okay, but you shouldn't live there. You should just visit. That's, that's my advice. Go and, go and kill. Thank you so much, Mike. Uh, I'm sure everyone on the call will uh, join. Thank you enormously for sharing your time with us and your insights and uh, a lot to take away and think about there. Thank you so much, Mike. I think we'll, we'll say goodbye there. And it's a really awkward thing about these Zoom calls that we just, we, I press the red button and, yeah. and, and that's it. Or, ordinarily, I mean, it's like <laughs> we, we do what we have to do and then hit the, I, I don't mind the red button. I mean, it's cool. You don't, you, 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 you appreciate the red button. Well, I'm not, I'm not even remotely offended now. Yeah. It's been a great session, Mike. Thank you so much for your time and uh, all the very best. And to you and to everybody. Okay. Bye. Cheers, Mike, see you later. Cheerio. Yeah. Bye-bye. I don't know where the red button is. Leave.